and welcome to Round Robin. I'm your host, Robin McCormick with the City of Hampton. And today we are going to talk with Vice Mayor Linda Curtis. Welcome. Good morning. You've been here before. <laughs> you were brand new <laughs> at was. the time. And you, in fact, were brand new. I mean, you, you walked onto council as vice mayor. That's pretty darn sort unusual. <laughs> yeah, well, I didn't walk on as, but I was elected. Your first I meeting. I think the first meeting, <laughs> yes. Um, yes. And, and people may think that you're new to this, and you are new to public I feel, policy. I mean, yes. it is a new role, but you've been an elected official in Hampton for a, a pretty good chunk of time. Right. Well, I was the Commonwealth's attorney for 17 years, from uh, 95 to 2012 when I retired. And um, I had been retired about a year and a half when Molly Ward left the council. And um, then new mayor George Wallace called and said, we have a vacancy, would you be willing to fill it? So I thought about it and said I would be willing to do that. Um, and, and it was really kind of way out of my comfort zone because um, I knew about criminal justice. I you know, understood the workings of law enforcement and that side of the city, but um, stormwater, uh, not so much. So. Um, had it been in the back of your mind? I mean, had you thought of it at all, or were no. you just... No, I had been approached at one point to run for council and said, no thanks. Um, but the timing was right for me. You and, had enough of a break. And I had enough of a break, and I um, was ready to do something a little more challenging. And it, challenging is the good word for it. Um, it's, it's very different being uh, on a member of city council than it is to be a constitutional officer. As a constitutional officer, I could make my own decisions. Um, if people liked what I did, then they loved me, and if they didn't, then they didn't like me much. Well, but I, but I was responsible for myself. I wasn't one of a group of people trying to collectively come to a decision. And, and what you did was sort of decided by judges and juries. I mean, right. I know there was a public opinion component, sure. but it wasn't the main component. <laughs> sure, absolutely. Well, there was a public opinion every four yes. years. Yes, <laughs> that's true. When I had to run for election, but, um, but, it, but it's a very different, if it's a very different role, um, and it was, as I say, way out of my comfort zone. Um, but I have learned a lot. Um, I think the the temporary appointment was for a period of about six months. And pretty quickly I figured out that the learning curve was such that it really made sense for me to stay on a little bit longer to use what I had started to learn. What do you think you, either with your background as a prosecutor or whatever else there is in your background, bring to council, bring to city governance? Well, I'm an attorney, for one thing. And, and while municipal law is not something that I worked with very much, um, I can certainly read a statute or an ordinance and understand where it's going. And we've had some interesting conversations. I mean, we've had some drafts of things, and I've been able to pick up something that that perhaps the city attorney might have not kind of seen the same way I did. And she said, oh, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. So they, it was redrafted. Oh, that's interesting. Um, and that's all behind the scenes. That's I don't, all I don't behind think the that's scenes. ever no. come up, mm -hmm. you no. know, in a meeting. No, that's You're because You're looking I, at things early. Right. And so, so that's, an, that's kind of a component. Certainly you don't have to be an attorney to do this, but I do think that that's a, a skill set that does bring something to the table. Um, and... The other thing I think maybe that I brought to the table was just my knowledge and understanding of the community. Um, having been in public office for 17 years, having run for election a number of times, um, you know, I've, I've had the occasion to be out in the community, to s visit different neighborhoods, to speak to different neighborhood groups about generally speaking a different subject. But I got to know a lot of people and I, I got to really kind of understand the dynamics of the city. So I think that helped. Um, but it's been, a, it's been an interesting learn, learning curve for me, and um, what I've learned has just reinforced my love for the city. Now, this is interesting because you didn't mention that the thing I thought you would mention, which is um, your, your view on crime and the causes of crime and the prosecution and what to do about prevention as well as um, apprehension where we are right now. Well, you know, in in my career as a prosecutor, I saw sort of a, a huge shift over over time from um, 
resources being provided for prevention, and then, and then it was three strikes, you're out. I mean, I had a, I was a prosecutor for 30 years, so that spans a lot of philosophies, and philosophies come and go in criminal justice as they do in everything right, else. Right. So, you know, I saw prevention being emphasized at one point. I saw, you know, three strikes, you're out, and enforcement, and strict enforcement, and no parole, and all of that um, come in. And I think we're... I think we've cycled back around now to an understanding that prevention really is a very, very important component um, and that it's far less expensive to provide resources and assistance to families that are struggling uh, than it is to, to incarcerate a significant portion of our population. People like easy solutions. Yes, they do. <laughs> and, you know, lock them away sounds like an easy solution. And, and it is a solution for some people. And I, I mean, I, I can't tell you I don't think that. Right, I certainly right. do. Um, there are people who need to be removed from the community for as long as we can keep them out. Um, but the greatest majority of those folks are going to come back. And if, if they come back with no job, no home, no stability they're going to do what they know how to do, which is hustle and, and do the things that ended them up in prison in the first place. So we have to do a better job. And, and actually, as I was kind of finishing up my career, things were, uh, were swinging back. Gov then Governor McDonnell had put together a reentry task force for every, lo every locality or every kind of um, region. And so Hampton and Newport News have a reentry council that mm -hmm. started shortly before I retired. Um, and so, you know, having, having those kinds of plans is very helpful, um, but we obviously really need to do more. And, and crime has certainly increased, and that's um, that not just in Hampton, but everywhere. I mean, you can't go anywhere right. in this right. region Right, I think people love anywhere. to count what's happening in Hampton and see that in isolation. No, and that's right. that's not fair. No, it isn't fair, and it, because you can't go to Newport News or Virginia Beach or Chesapeake or Suffolk or any of those other or places without seeing the same else. kinds of increases mm -hmm. that we've seen. It's a national problem. Um, and so, so nationally, you know, we're, we're kind of getting the drift that we need to do some more work with prevention. And it's important to remember, too, how expensive incarceration is. Yeah. And how and really... It, prevention programs, unfortunately, you have to keep the incarceration up while you're doing the prevention, so there's double paying, but, right. but the payoff should, right. should happen. And even things, even things like early childhood education that, that people may not immediately think of. Uh, think of as a crime prevention tool. But when children fail in school, drop out of school, I mean, that's a direct, there's a direct link between mm -hmm. that and then not having anything to do during the day, not having any means of em employment. So if you get children, and particularly at-risk kids, um, ready for school, ready to learn when they hit kindergarten, um, their chances of success and therefore their chances of not becoming one of those numbers is so much higher. Mm -hmm. So, so as a community, I think we're we're coming together around that. But you know, it's a marathon; it's not a sprint. And as you say, people want easy, quick solutions. And um, you know, we can talk about more cops on the street, and and those are things that make people feel better. But you cannot ever guarantee that a police officer is going to be in the right place at the right time right. to prevent a crime. So. You know, we have to we have to think differently about it. And it's interesting. We have I've injected this issue, so I'm going to let you talk about the issues you want to talk about in just a second. That's all right. But w one of the things our our police officers are doing is much more community relations, yes. and that is a preventative. Yes, it is. Um, you Absolutely. may not see the results immediately, but it it has that long term stabilizing community effect and involves the community. I mean, one of the things I keep thinking is government can't do everything in isolation. If the community is involved, we're all much more effective. No, government cannot solve the problem. That's, that's absolutely true. There has to be um, buy-in from the, absolutely from the ground up. And, and people have to be willing to change their communities, to change the way people in their communities think. That's hard. And that is hugely hard, mm -hmm. but it's not impossible. And, and the example that I always give about culture change is drunk driving. Um, you know, 30, 40 years ago, drunk driving was like, oh, well, you know, Sorry. yeah, we all know Slap we shouldn't do wrist. it, yeah. but, you know, it's not really a big deal. 
and Mothers Against Driving formed and, you know, did a campaign that lasted decades, but has truly, truly changed the culture around that issue. Mm -hmm. So I believe it can happen, but it's not an easy job. And as I say, it's a marathon, not a sprint. It is. So what, um, what are the issues you see as key in Hampton right now and for the short-term future? Well, for the short-term future, certainly we need to pay attention to crime and those are those those issues. I mean, the, uh, that is what people need to feel safe in their homes. People need to feel safe in their communities. Um, and I believe that the strategies that our police division is, is using both in the preventive stuff, the community policing, um, as well as some other programs that are going on in conjunction with the schools, in conjunction with our community centers, um, that, that those things will, will make a difference. Um, but, I, you know, one of the things I've learned about significantly since I've been on the council is the whole issue of economic development and its importance to a healthy community. Um, we have one of the highest tax rates in the region. I would like to see our tax rate for our homeowners lowered. Um, but city services are not going to cost less down the road. Nothing ever does. Right. So right. the only and way... And taxpayers continue to want more. That's more right. Parks, more that's services. right. And, and, and you want, in order to make your community a healthy, vibrant community where people want to come to live, mm -hmm. you have to provide those amenities. Um, so the only way that we can significantly increase our tax base is to bring in other dollars, bring in business dollars that relocate here, bring in tourist dollars um, that, that, you know, pay hotels taxes and meals taxes and, um, and fund our community activities that way. So, you know, a lot of people ask, because they, I don't think they've always thought it through, you know, why does government assist in, right, right. in, in luring businesses? Why are you giving financial incentives? And, and I mean, let's talk about Riverdale, because that is really one of the things that I'm the most excited about. Um, that was a piece of property that citizens told us, and, and I just ran two years ago and then just ran again, but two years ago when I ran at nearly every community forum I went to, people said, why can't you folks do something about Riverdale? Um, an aging shopping center, a lot of businesses had left, nothing really But the owners were content, basically. They were. To, to receive the rent right. payments, it was, you know, it, and so how... How? What? So what? What, what well, did we do? Well, <laughs> ultimately, well, ultimately, I mean, I, I guess for them the timing was right because I know the city had, um, prior to my involvement on council, city had a number of times um, yeah, well, that's made been efforts an issue for years, right? Efforts to um, to incentivize some improvements there, um, but they weren't willing to do it, and so apparently now, for whatever reason, the timing was right, and there was interest. There was outside interest, someone who was actively interested in developing that shopping center, and. And I'd really love to see the, you know, the shovels getting ready because it's nice to say it's going to change, but right now it looks the same. And, and as one of the other things I've learned about being in government is that everything takes about 10 times longer than you want it to. It really does. But, and I have to say, especially economic development, yeah. because, I mean, I heard of projects that were, they were working on when I first got here right. that barely are announced, much less, you know, seeing action. I mean, it's just... Business, you know, everybody thinks business moves quickly, and maybe compared to government, they do. But business moves pretty darn slowly yeah, too. Right, and 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 there are so many factors and so many moving parts to that conversation that it's often difficult to really understand why. But that deal occurred, and we are going to get a Kroger market, which is going to improve that mm -hmm. section. There's a an at home store that's coming in that is going to be wonderful, and that will bring other. Um, also more desirable businesses and, and enliven that stretch of Mercury Boulevard, which is so important because you've got Peninsula Town Center just past it, and that is that is thriving. Um, and I think he talked, the developer for, for Riverdale talked about not competing with Town Center, but looking at what would be complementary sure. and how you can grow the region instead of trying to fight for the same retailers, right. which makes no sense right. in the long run. Right, and, and Town Center is, uh, you know, the live, work, play environment um, that people are um, excited about. You know, the Chapman, which is the apartments over there, mm -hmm. um, are pretty much completely leased, and they are getting ready to expand um, because that's a desirable environment. People are interested and want to be able, people, and it's interesting because it's, it's both kind of the, 
millennials who we all talk about wanting that kind of experience, but there's also a lot of seniors there. There are a lot who of boomers, really like yes. to just be able to walk down the come down the elevator, walk out the door, go to a movie, have dinner, um, do your shot. You know, it's it's a wonderful opportunity. I, I saw that when we surveyed our residents about biking and um, and pedestrian, you saw a huge amount more actually in the boomer population than even the millennials. Right. A lot of our millennials are in the military. They're you know very dependent on cars, right. but. But um, you, there's a lot that those two very large segments of our population have in common. Right, right. And, and uh, I mentioned hotel taxes being a, a, a method of uh, increasing our tax base. Mm -hmm. um, we but it bought increases for, I mean, it helps us too, because the more amenities we have for tourists, That's the more right. amenities we get to enjoy. <laughs> but we bought that, the Motel 6 uh, and demolished it, and there has been interest in that property. Um, which suggests to me that in hopefully in not a whole lot of time, mm -hmm. um, there will be some more activity there, some um, some other hotel development or other kind of development on that site because that's right across from the convention center, yes. uh, which attracts lots of people. Visible from the interstate, it's a great location. It is a great location. So, you know, those are things that are important, I think, to our to our folks because even though you may not stay in whatever goes up on the Motel Six site. Um, y you will reap the benefits mm -hmm. of folks coming in and um, paying those hotel dollars and eating meals in our in our restaurants. It's 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 all to the good. So so that's what's and and you know I'm not sure when the rule changed because there was a time when government typically didn't get involved in private business, but somewhere along the line, some locality said, "I really want that business, and I'm willing to fork up some taxpayer dollars to make sure they come here. And now, if you don't play that game, That's right. you lose. I mean, if you decide as a locality we are not going to incentivize business to come here, then they're all going to go to your neighbors. And, and we can't afford to let that happen. So, And we have so many really wonderful um, opportunities in Hampton, with NASA being here and the aerospace industry and Langley Air Force Base. Um, you know, we have so many opportunities in the Magruder Corridor, which we've kind of designated as an, an aerospace park, mm -hmm. and um, you know, so all of the, all of that is growing, and there's activity out there, and 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 now there's going to be some some live work play opportunities out there yeah, because there fun. will be some um, some living space out there as well. So we're moving in the right direction, and it's very exciting. So safety, economic development. What else um, would you say as a third key issue or, or concern? Uh, quality of life for me is a, is a big thing. We, we've talked a lot, and this is another thing I've learned since being on council. We, we have this concept called placemaking. And it's, it's those sometimes very inexpensive things um, that make a community a place that people want to visit, that people want to live in. Um, and so I can, I can point to some very small things that we've done, like our porch swings. Mm -hmm. We put a couple of porch swings up. We put one up at Buckrow and one up at Mill Point Park, um, just to kind of see how the, the reaction was. Not expensive. Um, and people loved them. It was just an opportunity to sit by the water and enjoy. Um, and so we put some more in. And so those are, you know, there, there's other kinds of efforts along those lines. We've looked at some other cities and, and looked at some of the other things that places like um, Greenville, South Carolina have done. And, and we're looking at those kinds of ways to just make our community, make our downtown, make Phoebus, make Buckrow, make the places where people gather um, interesting and fun. Um, because that's what generates traffic. That's what, yes. that, and again, that goes back to economic development because when you generate foot tra traffic, then you have opportunities for retail and restaurants and all of those kinds of things. Well, and it is also a little bit also about authenticity and what makes us right. a unique place. And I think there was a time, um, 70s, you know, where people oh, wanted yeah. to be cookie cutters, where people wanted the same thing. And now there's a little bit more of a movement toward what sets us apart? Who are the unique individuals in our community and what are they doing and how can we as a government encourage and support that? Well, I, I wish every citizen and every visitor had an opportunity to be on the sixth floor of the Old Point Bank building uh, as we were yesterday when yes, we did a, a, a council retreat because to see that view of downtown and the waterfront, it's exquisite. It is absolutely beautiful. It's an incredible asset that we have. Um, 
but we and need. That's only one of our waterfronts. I know that's, that. <laughs> I know, so and we have so much. More. That's exactly right. But but as I sat there, you know, thinking about what we were doing and, and looking out at that, I thought, you know, this is just. It, it, it's refreshing. It's a it's a good thing to do because it reminds me of you know why I'm doing what I'm doing um, mm -hmm. because it is so beautiful. It's such a unique place. We have so many amazing assets, and and one of our biggest assets is our people. Yep. And we have uh, amazing people who live here, and and brilliant and smart and talented. So we just need to find a way to harness that energy and continue to make our community. Um, what it can be. I, I'm, I'm, I absolutely believe in this place. I, I spent, you know, 30 years as a prosecutor seeing kind of the dark side right, all the time. Right. And, you know, the, really at the end of, at the end of my career doing that, I, I had done and I had seen enough. Um, doesn't mean I, I in any way uh, shut a blind eye to, to that, but I spent a lot of time in that. So, Seeing our, our wonderful natural assets and having an opportunity every day to be a part of that is, is exciting for me. It's, it's just a much more positive experience. Okay, so look ahead to that positive. What do you see 15 years, 20, 25 years down the road that your council, your time period, what, what have we done, what do we look like at that point? Well, what I see um, is, first of all, um, a more vibrant downtown, a more vibrant Phoebus, uh, and Phoebus, so we haven't mentioned Phoebus because that's one of my favorite places on the planet. And they almost connect they as, they, as they both grow and become more vibrant. And connectivity is the key. That's a, that, I'm glad you said that because connecting Phoebus and downtown via water, mm -hmm. via bike, um, those are ways that those communities will, will thrive. Um, I, see Phoebe, I see Fort Monroe being um, an even more amazing place than it is now uh, with more development, not, not more commercial development. Yeah, people but think that our zoning effort means they're going to build buildings. No, no. They need to reuse. No, But right. you have to zone for that. Right, right. And, you know, the Park Service expanding its opportunities, mm -hmm. um, an enlarged uh, casemate museum, um, attractions out there. And then Phoebus being the natural gateway to that, I see... Um, you know, a hotel um, for access to Fort Monroe that's someplace there in Phoebus. I would love, honestly love to see on the Fuller site a boutique hotel. That would make me so happy. I mean, just that, that would never be a big, that would never be a Holiday Inn right, or, right, a, right. you know, a large footprint kind of place. But it's just, it would be so cool. And those of us who remember Fuller's and loved Fuller's, Eat dirt um, cheap. just... Really, that would be, that's a dream. I would love to see that happen. Um, and then connect Phoebus with Buckrow. Um, connect Fort Monroe with Buckrow. Um, again, walking, biking, w by water, uh, use, utilizing all of these amazing resources. You know, people in Kansas go, you've got like a lot of water here. Yes, we do. We do. And it's, and it, sometimes it's a curse, um, yes. but most of the time it's a blessing and it's so beautiful. And so we need to, so I see those. I see those being vibrant areas of their own, with their own personalities, um, attracting people to live there, attracting people to visit. Um, I see that the town center, the Cent Coliseum it's Central, the retail hub at the very the retail least. hub, and you have um, the office hub right nearby. You know our healthcare, our healthcare hub. I mean, I, I see those things continuing to develop, and I see um, our relationship continuing to grow with NASA and Langley because those are absolute mainstays of our mm -hmm. community um, without which we would be not only intellectually poor and economically poor but I mean they just bring a lot of great people to our community. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And thank you for watching. I hope you've learned a little bit more about how the vice mayor feels and the issues that we're facing and how we can work together with our government to um, help create a better future. Thanks for watching.